your young servant Silvestro Pritoni, rejoicing in a voice sufficiently good to practice music and wishing to retain it, begs your serene highness to make it such that he is without those instruments which would allow the change of voice to take place. During the 18th century, as many as 100,000 small boys were castrated to preserve their high singing voices. Of these, a mere handful became the most famous singers of the age. The world's first international superstars, they were perhaps the greatest virtuoso singers ever heard on earth, the castrati. But the mature castrato voice didn't sound like a child, nor did it sound like a woman. Nothing in the whole of music is as fine as the fresh young voice of a castrato. No woman's voice has the same firmness, the same strength, and the same smoothness. And it didn't sound like a male countertenor or falsettist. In this film, we're going to explore the sound and the world of the Baroque operatic castrati. And in a unique scientific experiment, we'll attempt to bring something of this lost voice back to life. For the whole of my adult singing life, I've been fascinated by the castrati and the extraordinary music that they sang. These kings of the 18th century operatic stage were the richest, the most highly sought after, the most extraordinarily virtuosic, the most pursued in many ways of all the singers we've ever heard. And for 200 years now, they've been extinct. The thing that made the castrato voice special appears to be the effect that that singer had on the audience. If one can understand something about what the special nature of that sound was, it will help us understand what it is that communicates from one human being to another. To do this to a child when every single moment, every day of their lives will be frankly adversely affected by their physical appearance, their early osteoporosis, their lack of an ability to reproduce. It seems to me really not emotionally cost-effective. May a jealous, despicable, fierce, effeminate, gluttons, covetous, cruel, inconstant, suspicious, furious, insatiable. They cry like children if they're left out of an entertainment. Well, the knife has indeed made them chaste, but this chastity is of no service to them. Nicholas Clapton, a countertenor and castrata historian, is curator of a new exhibition in London devoted to the German composer Handel and his castrati. Handel was the first great composer to write Italian opera in England. Handel was absolutely the business as an opera composer and as such had enough clout to hire the very finest singers including some of the greatest castrati the world has ever known. Caffarelli, Senazino, Carastini, Guadagni. The only one he never got hold of was Farinelli. I'd like you to meet three gentlemen I like to think of as friends of mine. There's Farinelli and Senazino and Guadagni by the window. Farinelli never worked for Handel. Senazino did for about 15 years. And here he is on stage in Handel's Rodelinda, about to sing the most famous aria from that opera, Dove Sei. Guadagni was much younger than the other two singers. He was described as a wild and reckless singer. 
and was accused of uh, quite a few amorous adventures while he was in London. He was such a good actor that eventually he was famous as Gluck's Orfeo. <laughs> Well, a Baroque opera fanatic might like to make out that castrati were specially invented to sing lots of notes on an 18th century stage. This is, of course, nonsense. Castration has been used as a punishment, as a means of subjugation, for thousands of years. We certainly know of eunuch choirs in a Christian context as early as the 4th century in Constantinople. And there they flourished for more than 800 years until the time of the Fourth Crusade, when Constantinople was sacked by the forces of Western Christendom. And the castrati, who had been singing there with great fame and considerable scandal, um, suddenly disappeared off the face of the earth. But 400 years later, castrati suddenly reappeared in Italy. In 1589, Pope Sixtus V reorganized the choir of St. Peter's. Castrati would now take the high parts that had previously been sung by either boys or falsettists. Falsetto means a little false voice, which is really grossly unfair, because there's nothing false or unnatural about a falsetto voice. It's a perfectly normal function of any adult male. And the irony is, however, that it was the castrati who came to be referred to as the natural Soprano, soprani naturali, which seems very strange to us. Nobody in Britain understands both the natural and the synthetic human voice better than York University's electronics professor, David Howard. The voice of the castrato worked in the same way that my voice or your voice works. <laughs> this is a medical model of the larynx which shows us the basic working parts. This is the Adam's apple, the part you can feel if you move your finger up and down your throat. But if we turn it so we can see into it, we can see the vibrating structures, the vocal folds themselves. And as they open and close like this, they would be vibrating. And these vibrations are very rapid. If this was a boy's larynx, the length of the vocal folds is around about five millimeters. In the case of women, it's nearer eight millimeters, and the man, it's 1.4 centimetres. So for the boy's voice, with the small vocal cords, the boy also has a small mouth or vocal tract above that, and he is able to produce a sound which many would describe as being pure, rather simple. The woman's voice has slightly larger vocal cords, but they're working into a mouth cavity which is rather bigger And so she is able to work with a larger range of acoustic possibilities in colouring the sound. Men sing in a range that's roughly an octave lower. The man also has a vocal tract or mouth cavity that's much bigger. But men are able to sing in the same range as a boy or woman by using what's known as falsetto. To produce a falsetto sound like that, what I'm doing is reducing the bulk of the vocal cords that are vibrating. And I'm doing that by setting the vocal folds up so that if you were looking straight into my larynx, you would see the vocal folds like this and they would be vibrating like that. We call that full body contact of the vocal folds. But for falsetto, we pull the bulk of the vocal fold material out of the way and only the top edges can vibrate. So we have a thin string, and a thin string will vibrate at a higher frequency. The castrato voice was not falsetto. The castrati had larynxes of boys, and therefore their natural pitch range was up there with the boys and the women. But in addition, they had a man's vocal tract, so they had all the sonic timbral possibilities that a man has, and big lungs, so their power source was huge. They could sing high notes, and they could sing them for a long time. Of 
course, what people are really interested in is the operation. And here